Father, we just thank you and we give you praise, honor, and glory this morning. I know, Father God, you're looking down upon this congregation. And I know you know each and every heart and the heart's desires. I'm asking right now, Father God, that you perform the miracle that each one needs. And Father God, the young lady that's driving around and has no place to lay her head, I'm asking you, Father God, right now to, to be with her and give her the miracle that she needs. This morning, Father, there's, there's a newness in the atmosphere. There's a heaviness in the atmosphere. And I know it's the weight of your glory, Father, that you're dropping upon your people. We receive the weight of that glory right now, Father. We allow it to consume us from the crown of our head to the soles of our feet. We thank you for your angels, Father God, that are moving throughout the, the sanctuary. Thank you for your Holy Spirit and your Son, Jesus. Answer each heart's cry, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, Chuck Pierce and two other prophets are saying that um, at the end of April, we're going to start, and today's the last day of April, we're going to start seeing a lot, of, a lot of angelic activity. And God has been talking to us about the angels are there, and we are going to start seeing them. And I'm waiting for that day when we can really start seeing the angels. We know they're there, but I would like for one to come and talk to me face to face. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> And you would catch them out of the corner of our eyes or something. But, you know, did what you saw one face to face? You did? She wants to give a testimony of seeing an angel. Somebody take her microphone. As I was... As I was worshiping, uh, when they had the ankle holds, and in the beginning, I could see the angels and trumpets, trumpets. They were singing the trumpets, and they were lined up all this way, and they were trumpets, and there was a lot of dancing around here. That's all I wanted to say. And wow. different sizes, different sizes, and go. I see go. Beautiful. I think it's awesome that God gives uh, Astrid all these uh, vis visions. And all you have to do is ask and you receive, right? He knows your heart. He knows if it's ready or not. This morning we're going to talk about an Isaiah 60 church. And we've had that scripture up there for quite a few years. And I know the first time we put it up there, um, the glory had already dropped to a certain degree in the church. And that's why God put that up there. It says, it's Isaiah 61 through 4. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will rise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together, they come to you. Your son shall come from afar, and your daughter shall be nursed at your side. So arise and shine. Why should we arise and shine? For your light has come. God has shown his light upon us, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. So each one of us, when God gave us that scripture, a little bit of the glory was placed upon us. Then it was up to us to allow this glory to increase. 
it was up to us how much we yielded to God, how much of the glory that we were, would be having. This is a wake-up call spoken to the people of God. God is he's speaking to us this morning. He wants us to wake up and understand that he wants to use each one of you to go out there and bring the lost and the dying in. He wants to use you with signs, wonders, and miracles. The glory of the Lord is shining. Wake up. And you know, I put that down there because we don't really, we have never really fully taken that scripture into our hearts. And, you know, and the glory of the Lord is shining upon us. And we need to wake up and start allowing God to use us in a more magnificent way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Did you read about a church, the church that last Sunday, you know, they were having a revival meeting. A revivalist came in. And the church is supposed to hold 75 people, and they had 100 and some show up. And they had to put them in the nursery and stuff. They called the overflow. But the revivalist really wasn't expecting what happened. And without the sermon being given, the God's glory fell. And all kind of miracles happened in the service. And then they even got reports afterwards, you know, that this week, of the different healings and things that took place that day in that church. See, God wants to drop his glory like that all the time. But right now he's dropping it here and there. And it's how much are we hungry for? You know, really and truly, if we're really super hungry for the glory to drop, God should be dropping his glory in here right now. See, when I'm in our homes even. But we have to really be hungering, and not just today, get excited today, but tomorrow and the next day and the next day. We have to keep that hunger going. And it's not to hold it to ourselves, it's just so we can share it with others. Are any of you, are you, any of you think, God, well, I would love you? So you see somebody that needs to be healed. You say, God, why isn't there enough glory in me to reach out and heal that person? You know, you don't do anything but the glory in, 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 in you reaches out and heals that person. Are, are you to, to that stage? If you're to that stage where you constantly think, God, where is the anointing that these miracles happen as they did in the days past? You know, okay, so you need, you're around somebody that's really needs a really deep deliverance. And are you hungry enough to say, God, why is there enough anointing in me that just them being with me that they aren't totally delivered? You know, isn't that what happened with Jesus? He walked into a room and the, and the devils just started talking and running and they wanted away from him. Do you ask yourself, God, why isn't there enough anointing in me to cause that to happen? All right, right here, Isaiah presents a vision of hope and restoration, not just for the people of Israel, but for all the nations. See, and this isn't just for us to have the light shining on us and the glory on us. It's for everybody you meet. You, you should have all that anointing in you, and everybody you meet should know they're standing in the very presence of the Father. It's really hard for me for that not to happen after I walked so many years in that happening. But then God said, don't want what you used to have for what I'm giving you is so much better. And you think, how can you get any better than that? But, you know, God's going to do something great and powerful. And he's trying to get this church. I'm, I just preach in this church, all right? He, he's trying to get this church ready so he can use you in these great signs, wonders, and miracles. All right, mothers, you, you know, why is it that we are so full of the glory of God and the anointing of God, but yet that doesn't reach out and touch our children? We have to ask ourselves that. Is there something I'm not, I mean, is something in me that's causing it to stop? I mean, I'm not saying that if there is. If these are things you have to, I think about this constantly because I don't want to be a roadblock to anybody. Stumbling block, whatever you call it. 
And I want the glory of God to be constantly shining so that no matter who, it, and I really believe it should start in my own first. Because God said he's going to start in homes for families, and what he said. So that our anointing should be strong enough to work in our homes first. Now don't get under condemnation. Jesus couldn't do anything in his home, could he? That none of them believed he was Jesus. So, you know, so don't get under condemnation. Just think about this. Get in God's face, say, God, is there something in me that you need to clean up or I need to change so that the anointing can flow like a river and touch even my family? Here's what God said. I am doing the very same thing for the nations this day. I am calling you forth to rise and shine your lights into the darkest generation the church has ever witnessed. Multitudes dying, multitudes are going into the abyss every second of every day. Hell enlarges its borders to take in the deprived. All right, let's read Isaiah 5.13. My people re don't really know God. Could that be one reason why the anointing's not strong? So they will be captured and taken away. Everyone, the respected leaders and the common people as well, will be hungry and thirsty. They will die, and the place of death will open its mouth wide, it's, that's hell, and swallow many of them. Then the noisy crowds and all the beautiful, happy people who are now so comfortable will go down into the grave. I, I don't believe that we, I'm not saying that, but I don't believe the body of Christ as a whole knows God in, a, in its truest sense. And I think that is why the enemy is able to come in and rob us of whatever God's trying to give us, or even what he has given us. He, the devil can come in and take that away from us because we truly don't understand the depth of God. How many of you have been finding yourself that you're even you're questioning the depth of the word. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong. I mean, you're trying to figure out, God, really, how deep does this word go? What is there in here that's hidden from us that we don't know yet? You know, because God said, greater things would we do. So somewhere in that word, that thing is hidden, and God wants us to seek it out. Does that make sense to you? And I think if we spent more time uh, dwelling on God who he is and what he's doing, the less trouble we get into. <laughs> you know, your mind would be, you know, God said that your mind should be stayed on him, right? And so really true, if you're calling yourself a leader, then your mind should be stayed on Christ. No matter what you're doing, constantly seek in his face to lead God and direct you. And sometimes we get caught up in our family not being saved and then we get our eyes off of God, then we lose what he's given us. And how many of you can say that right now your children are the biggest obstacle in your walk with God? Right now the devil's working through children like he's never worked through them before. And about the time you think you got it all together, here comes your kids with a different problem. And you wonder why it was that you've been praying, holding up prayer, covering them in the blood. You're wondering, why is this happening? And but we know that the devil's after the children right now. He's after them like you wouldn't believe. But could we call that the seed? He's after the seed. You know, think about this. I think really we need to start thinking about things more than we... Uh, Think about, you know, things of God, I mean, more than we think about the things of the world. God said, children, you must at all costs stand at your post this day. Rise and shine. Bring the glory of heaven into the darkened world. So much destruction all across the land. Very few walked on the narrow path that I sat before them. And the world is looking for hope. I'm sorry. Let's read that again. So much destruction on all across the land. Very few walked on the narrow path that I sat before them. The world is looking for hope, and there is no hope set before them. Murderers, robberies, rape, all manner of evil on all sides. No hope, absolutely no hope for the weary in soul. Who will go for me? 
who will lay down their lives and go into the highways and byways to make disciples and bring hope to the hopeless, who will bring in the harvest? See, God's calling to us this morning. He, he wants us to come forth and, and to be everything he's called us forth to be. I'm hearing him say he wants this church to be harvesters. You start bringing in the harvest and quit looking at where you're at and just keep your eyes on God and just keep walking with him. There's always going to be trouble on all sides. You know, read your word. It's not going to go away. And so what you have to do is what God says, keep your eyes upon me. Don't look at your circumstances and just trust me. And as we do that, then God can flow through us. There's a great and a marvelous thing that God's getting ready to take the church into. He wants each one of you to be vessels of honor that he can work through. But, you know, like God told me years ago, he said, we're in a tug of war. Satan's after you. Jesus wants you. And it's up to you who wins the battle, the tug of war. And you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to fight. We could not win this battle laying down. And with Chuck Pierce and him seeing all those angels, God said he's sending the angels to fight for us. And Chuck Pierce said in that thing, that Barbara sent it to me, that the angels are situated in the place the states are supposed to be in, and they're going to decide whether they take their sword out and fight for that state or not. And I really, then I relate that to myself. God is sending an angel to me. And that angel's going to make a decision. She really wants to, you know, God to use her. So he's going to, you know, unsheath his sword and fight for me to keep me safe from the evil one. Are you understanding that? But if he, he, you know, they know our heart, God knows our heart. And if they see that we're really not interested in battling, they're not going to waste their energy. All right. A thread runs through scripture beginning in Exodus 19.6, where the Lord first spoke these words to Moses, asking him to share with the Israelites. He said, you, each one of you, will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. What was God looking for? It is evident that he wasn't looking for just one person to serve as a priest, but he was longing for a nation to step into that place. He just, remember, he told us this just isn't going to be a one man show. We're all going to work together with God to perform the miracles that God needs performed. I was reading an article where this man said it, he used to preach to the thousands, and his assistant pastor was dying and he said God just told me to tell you you will once again preach to the thousands and the man said I couldn't believe that but he said um, he's working with some sort of a, a movie and he said through that movie he's once again speaking to the thousands and he said well, exactly what that young man spoke to him right before he drew his last breath had now come to pass and that was just a couple weeks ago so don't you see God is performing miracles all over the place? We have to just be in that place where God can use us. We have to have our hearts anchored in him. Nobody else. Are you listening? I had company in my house. My two grandchildren were there last night. And my older, the older one said, we have never forgot what you taught us about God. And that's what sustained us through the years, the trying years we just came through. They used to travel with me, and they used to hand out the tapes and everything. But they also listened to the messages. So you see, you are influencing people around you, whether for good or for bad. But, you know, it just sort of thrilled my heart when they said, this is what, because they went through some bad stuff with their parents. This is what brought us through those times. We remembered what you told us. So you, you, what does God say? Teach them in a way they should go, and they, know, they will never depart from it. So you're an influence, whether you know it or not. For bad or for good, you're an influencer. You cannot, you cannot uh, go down to the enemy. You have to bring the enemy up to you. You, know, you. you have to stay on your level with God and don't allow the enemy to tear you down. 
Okay, so I said it's evident that God wasn't looking for just one person to serve as a priest, but he was longing for a nation to step into that place. Notice Peter's declaration in 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are his chosen people. You know, the remnant is God's chosen people. The king's priest. You are a holy nation. People who belong to God. He chose you to tell about the wonderful things he has done. He brought you out of the darkness of sin into his wonderful light. That's First Peter 2, 9. You ought to read it over and over until you get it in your spirit. The longing of God's heart was becoming a reality in Peter's days. God wants it to become a reality today. Every believer has been called to be a priest unto God. I hope we are beginning to grasp the significance of our role as a royal priesthood. We have been seated with Christ in heavenly places, and it is for a purpose. How many times does God have to tell you that you're not of this world? He's been telling us that for years. We are not of this world. We are a peculiar people that he has set apart for this dispensation of time to do, to do great signs, wonders, and miracles. You know, it, 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 you know, my heart bleeds for the young people because they don't have a standard to look to. There's double standards everywhere. And, and you know, unless God really reveals himself to them, they have a hard time because they hear one thing preached and then they see something else going on and they really don't know what to believe. So you need to be praying for your children that God opens up their spiritual eyes to see as he sees. You know, I might look at you and think, you know, God's never going to be able to change you to use you, but that's not true. That's not how God sees you. God sees you already perfected. Even in your sin nature, he always sees you perfected. And then he's working at you, bringing you to that high place in him. Jesus Christ is on his throne at the right hand of the Father, and we are seated there in him. A throne signifies governmental authority. The one on the throne has been given all authority and the right to rule. As we own our position in him, we must acknowledge and embrace our inherited authority to rule with him. Why do you keep allowing the enemy to tell you that you have no authority? Think about this. I, you know, I don't know whenever, you know, I always went to church when I was born again, I changed, even though it wasn't bad, but something inside of me changed and I have a hard time with watching people in the house of God and they don't change, don't you? You know, they get the same touch that, that, that I got, but they don't change and I don't understand that. I can't understand how you can be in the presence of God and then walk out of here and Go back to your old lifestyle. And I'm not, that's, I'm not condemning anybody. I'm just saying that's where I'm at. And I know sometimes when I'm weeping for the people, Christ, it's Jesus weeping for the people. And, you know, and what we're doing is we're interceding because he has such a wonderful plan for you, but the enemy is in there twisting and turning and everything apart, you know, and, and you give in to that instead of giving in to the authority God gives you. You, really, you know, God's really getting ready to do a great and mighty thing. And he so wants each one of you to, to enter into that thing that he's doing. We step into our royal role by choosing to enforce the rule of God's kingdom from our seated position in Christ. If you're not in Christ, and by that I mean if you're out there just flip-flopping all over the place, you're really not in Christ. You don't understand who you are. You don't understand you're a true child of God. And so the enemy can just do anything he wants to with you, can he? We watch it all the time, right? And, you know, don't let him do that to you. You know, we who are seated in Christ and know it, we're all seated in Christ, but you have to know it and, and cling to that. The de devil can't take us and flop us around like an old rag. 
because we fight back, right? And we let him know who we are. But that, you know, we don't judge others because they haven't gotten there yet. But I, I ask God, what is in that person that they can't quite grasp what you've done for them? Then I listen and then whatever he tells me, that's what I pray for, you know. All right, as his ecclesiastes, we take up our keys, binding and loosening, and bring heaven to earth by releasing the decrees and declarations we hear from the Spirit of God. In other words, whatever God tells you, that's what you decree and declare. You just can't go around or talking out of your head. You have to hear from God and then decree and declare what he is saying. Ephesians 1.22 says, and he put all things under his feet. You know, God put all things under Jesus' feet and gave Jesus to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus read from the Isaiah scroll proclaiming these words, Luke 4, 18. That this is what Isaiah proclaimed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has no... Well, this is what Jesus said. I'm sorry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Listen, this is what he's done to you. So listen to what we're reading. He has... The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind to set up liberty of those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Are we doing that? You know, are we doing that? This is think day. Think, what am I doing? God said there are miracles in you. See that in you that I went to birth every day. They have not birthed because you do not believe that you are seated in heavenly places with Jesus, my son. Come on. Somebody has to grasp this. Somebody has to grasp this and they walk out the door or even in here, you know, just all of a sudden, boom, you know, the Holy Spirit, it can, can get into gear and he can use you to work through you to do great signs, wonders, and miracles. All right. Part of our role as his royal priesthood is to carry on the works of redemption and restoration that Jesus came to do. What an incredible honor to be able to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, binding up the brokenhearted, proclaiming freedom for captives, and releasing prisoners from darkness. What a joy to proclaim as his priest the year of our Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our Lord. There is no greater joy than, to, this is what God says, there is no greater joy than to walk in the fear of the Lord. In that fear, all the Godhead operates. There is nothing withheld from those who fear the Lord. Proverbs 19.23 says, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. See, and God's told us there's no fear of the Lord in the house of God anymore. Fear of the Lord is the last of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit in Numbered in Isaiah 11, 2 and 3. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon you, is Jesus. So the Spirit of the Lord first. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord was on Jesus. So why do we not have a fear of the Lord? His delight is in the fear, you know, Jesus' delight is in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Fear of the Lord is easily the most misunderstood out of all the Holy Spirit's gifts. Simply put, fear of the Lord is a gift of reverence for him as our creator. It allows us to remember who we are and who he is. Now, how many of you really don't want to make a, make a, give God a, a bad name? You know, it would just kill you if you knew that you you did something to give God a bad name or place shame on Him. 
See, this is what the fear of the Lord is. You reverence him to the point that you don't want to bring any shame to him through what you do. Are you listening here? As we move forward to embrace our cause as Ecclesiastes and royal priesthood, we will see the Isaiah 60 church emerge. The Isaiah 60 church is a lighthouse and a beacon for the nations engulfed in the thick darkness. We are experiencing a time of thick darkness, and the Lord is calling the church to arise and shine to her full stature and position. As we embrace our call and respond to his awakening spirit, we will need to be grounded in these things that will be a strength for us and others. See that God's teaching us something here, church. God called us the Isaiah 60 church back then. We are still the same thing, but we, are, we have not grown to full stature of what the Isaiah 60 church should be doing. The Isaiah 60 church walks in hope. Is that where I was at or did I skip something? Hope acts as an anchor for us. It stabilizes us amid the tumultuous waves of trials and oppression that come against us. Hope acts as a light for others, pointing the way when darkness hides the faith, I'm sorry, the path we should take. Hope causes us to be immovable and unshakable. Hebrews 12 indicates, indicates that we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Here we dead at home. We grow in hope by focusing on what? Truth. The Isaiah 60 church walks in favor. God's favor on our lives is a work of his grace. But as we grow in hope, it opens a door to his favor in our lives. And Isaiah 65 and 6 says, Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you, the wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you, the multitudes of camels shall cover your land, the dromedaries of Midian and Nepha. All those from Sheba shall come, they shall bring gold and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. You know, we are, we are the... Um, Philadelphia church. And if you read the Philadelphia church, God said the nations will come and, and sit at our feet and listen. Even though they say we're not of God, they will come and, and they will sit in, in the presence of the almighty God. Church, you know, you young kids, you get all excited and you want to serve God, but do you really serve him? Do you really sell yourself totally out to him? When you come into the house of God, nothing in the house of God will, will disrupt you. Your attention will be full, fo fully focused upon God. And, and you won't be carrying on. You'll be, and, and I see this. This is why I'm saying this. You won't carry, be carrying on. You won't be writing little notes, you know, whatever you do, coloring pictures. But you'll be focused on God because you want God to really fall upon you. And you really want to be changed. And you really want to go out there and, and get other people saved. You know, all the killing on the streets right now, it's terrible. You know, you guys could make a difference. You guys could really, you could make a difference. You young men of the, this profess you love Jesus. Are you doing anything for Jesus? Are you really out there getting people saved? Are you really let, uh, you know, letting people see a difference in you? Because that's the way you draw people to God is people see you being changed. They see you being different. I say that because that's what people did with me. People said, you know, I want whatever it is that you have. Do they want what you have? Or do you have what you don't have anything, so therefore you can't draw them? These are all things you need to think about because when God does his full glory drop, if you're not in, then you're going to be out. If you aren't fully persuaded and, and sold out to God, then God's going to let you standing. So you have to really and truly com commit yourself to God right now. Search your heart and, and do you, in your mind, do you really want to serve God? Do you really want to pay the price? Do you really want to be different? Or do you want to fit in? You want to be just like everybody else normal. We are supposed to be a peculiar people not normal people, and we should stand out. Why? Because we're different. Not different evil, but different. 
on the good on the good side, right? God wants more for us than just to get by. He desires that we flourish. As we flourish and grow in favor, we represent our, our good father. But our favor is not just for us to enjoy. It is for the benefit of others. Stewarding our favor will, well involves honoring the people he places in our lives in arenas of influence. You, you know, you should be, you're, you should have the favor of God on you, and then that favor should pour out. It should be an overflow into other people's lives. It isn't happening right now, but it is, please, it's not a condemnation thing. It's the enemy stopping it. And the enemy's trying to discourage the church in every way he can. So don't don't beat yourself over the head. Just take this, listen to it, and then talk. Let, you know, just get before the Father and and just talk to the Father about it, and let Him show you what it is that either you have to change, or that where He's taken you to. And I know that sometimes when God's doing a new thing, we don't understand what's going on. So we just sort of say, well, you know, because we don't understand what God's doing. And that's okay. That's okay. The disciples never understood what Jesus said. They were with him day and night, right? So don't, don't beat yourself over the head. But stay in the presence of God until you understand what it is he's trying to do with you. Luke 2.52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with who? God and men. I mean, he was God's son, but it says that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. If it was necessary for Jesus to grow in his favor, then it is certainly necessary for us as well, isn't it? The Isaiah 60 church walks in peace and well-being. Isaiah 60, 17 said, instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. And instead of stones, iron, I will also make your officers peace and your magistrates righteousness. God is getting ready to change some of your lives drastically. And this is why he's teaching you this this morning. Something drastically is going to change and you're going to be walking in a different, I'm hearing the word, venue than you were before. And God's trying to get you to really stop and think, where am I at? And God, I don't understand things right now. And so I'm seeking for your wisdom. You need to talk to me. I always I'll say, if I have a problem, I'll say, I'll say, Father, what exactly is going on here right now? You know, this, you know how else are you going to find out? Because your friends are as dumb as you are. You know? <laughs> You know, and so God's the only one that really knows, right? And so you go to God and ask God, what's going on here? I do that all the time. I don't even bother asking anybody else because I know they don't know or they just sent me an email already. Amen. <laughs> Come on. God has transformation and upgrades for his people. Like hope, peace is a very valuable commodity in these times. In times of crisis, your peace will be called a pawn. We learn to walk in peace by cultivating it during trials and times of crisis. So don't, don't be fussing about what you're going through, you know, because God's teaching you something. My reply to God is teach me quickly. <laughs> yeah. All right. He desires we all walk in, the, in his peace, his shalom with nothing missing and broken. You know, as a pastor, you get many phone calls and people are upset. And I said, uh, I said to Gabriel the other day, I said, you know, when people call me and they're really upset, I said, I can pray peace for them. I said, I never go, I never go into that place of it being, not being in peace. <laughs> and Gabriel said, well, because you're different. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think it's because I found peace in God years ago. And I stayed there, you know, and, and things don't bother me. You know, I had somebody comment one time when I sat beside my husband who was dying. She doesn't even flinch an eye. You know, I can't keep him from dying. All I can do is sit there and pray quietly to myself and bring a peace in the room, right? And they never could understand it because there are type of people that were yelling and screaming and scolding and bawling, you know, and flopping on the bed and top the person saying, oh, don't go. I don't do that. 
you know? And I, sometimes I think, am I dead? <laughs> Have I no feelings? Because you bet I'm always in perfect peace. And this is where God wants each one of us today is in perfect peace. So that when the trials and tri- well, so what, what if you have a friend who just had, you know, or let's just say a car accident and they lost two of their children. What do you, they're, they're, they're falling apart. You have to be in perfect peace to minister to them, right? So let's work on being in perfect peace in God. The Isaiah 60 church walks in intimacy. Isaiah 60 verse 19, the sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light and your God, your glory. Well, you know, that's a pretty good thing there because if we're going to lose all of our grids or whatever, we're going to need God to shine this light, right? (laughs) So we can see. Your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light. Uh, see, we can stand on this when the grids go down. God, you're my light. Light up my room. And I'm serious. Light up the room. I'm serious. We need to start calling on our God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who performs miracle after miracle after miracle. Amen. Okay, so he's going to be our light, and the days of your mourning shall be ended. And that was in Isaiah 60, 19, and 20. The people described in this verse know that God is their light source. He is the source of their strength and their glory. As we behold his glory, we become like him. We are totally dependent on him. And like a battery that must be recharged, our light will want if we are not connected to him, the source of our light. I don't know if that's right or not. All right, the Isaiah 60 church is answering the call to awaken. You guys need to go forth and say to your friends, you need to wake up because this darkness is going to get darker and and you, you need to get yourself right right now, right? Before it's too late, wake up and get your get yourself right with God. Each one of you in here need to, if you haven't got yourself decided to walk with God, you need to wake up, commit yourself to God, and stay there, and quit procrastinating. Don't go one day you want to serve God, then next day you don't. You know the enemy knows what kind of seesaw he can put you on. Break the seat, <laughs> get off the seesaw and be all that God has called you to be. All right. As carriers of his light, we will step in, step into our call to displace the thick darkness with the powerful kingdom of light that we carried. Now, I was sort of making a jest about the light, but, you know, really the light that God's talking about is his light, and he wants it in us. It's a spiritual light, and we need to carry that light for the world to see. We need to carry that light into the dark places where people have no hope. You know, come on. You kids, instead of fighting your parents, your mother, your father, whatever, why don't you just go ahead and fight the devil and serve God? It'll make everybody happy. (laughs) Bring peace into your home, right? Uh, And I'm serious about that, too. If you kids would fight the devil as far as you fight uh, your parents, my goodness, you'd be the brightest lights around, wouldn't they, Alan? Thank you. His glory, his weighty presence rises upon us, and the world is watching and waiting for the Isaiah 60 church to step fully into their her call to arise and shine. Isaiah, and God is saying, Isaiah 60 church, I am calling you this day to arise and shine and allow my glory to show itself mightily upon you. What God wants wants us to do this day is truly grasp Isaiah 60, 1 through 5. Be the Isaiah 60 church. And by that, whenever you go forth, that you'll be so rooted and grounded in God that the light of God will shine forth from you. And it truly will save lives. Are you listening? You know, Brother Allen does deliverance, and and God uses him for altars, and and that's great. And he tells me the things that God shows him that's in people, and it's awesome. And, you know, more or less what God is doing is shining a light, right, inside that person 
to let you see what's going on in there, right? And if you didn't have that, if you weren't walking close to God, seeking God's face, he wouldn't shine that light into that person's lives to show you the, the intimate innermost parts of that person. So you have to be, you have to be really walking with God because if God revealed something to you about a person, you weren't walking with God, you'd destroy that person. You would talk about him. Ah, oh, you know what God showed me. And then instead of using it for God's glory, you would use it to destroy the person. And God really and truly wants to get inside of each one of you. And he wants to truly use you mightily. But he can't do that unless you're totally sold out to him. And by being totally sold out to him, you no longer care what happens to you. You no longer care. You know, we've, my daughter and I was talking about, you know, Job lost everything and lost his health. You know, you're going to have to be like that. What, you know, it doesn't matter what the devil takes from you, you're going to serve God. But are you really ready to do that? Are you really ready to give up everything? Are you really sold out to yourself first that you want to be sold out to God? You have to sell yourself out to that idea before you can go any further in that need. I, just, I didn't know that. God just revealed that. <laughs> but that's true, isn't it? So are you really sold out to yourself that you really want to serve God? Or is this just something that just, you know, it's a little bit of a, just like kids do, it's the fancy for the time, but then you lose it again. But I'm looking around here this morning, and each one of you have stayed. <laughs> so that means you're sold out. That means you really don't understand everything, but you're really sold out, and you're ready to go ahead and allow God to use you in any fashion that he wants to use you. And when he's using you, I can, I'm here to tell you, you won't understand it then either. But you just go, you've already sold out, and you just keep right on walking. So the altar is open if you want the Isaiah 60 church to truly come alive within you. And you really want to be sold out to God 100%. The altar is open for that.